Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Independent Film Festival Boston. My name is Brian Tam. I'm the executive director here at IFF Boston, and I'm very glad that you've joined us uh, for this uh, producer's uh, roundtable panel. Um, before we get started, I want to thank a few people because it takes a lot of people to make this festival happen. So I want to thank all of our sponsors, especially WBUR, uh, our staff, our volunteers, our donors, our members, everyone who's helped support us over the last year. Uh, I especially want to thank our venues. Uh, we unfortunately aren't quite there yet. They are all working on opening, but they're going to need your help to make sure that they can do so. So please check out their websites to find out how you can help them. Uh, if you would like to uh, support us, uh, we recommend you go to iffboston.org and find out how you can do so uh, via donation or becoming a member or many other ways. We would love to have you join us. Um, we, uh, we've all been locked inside for quite a while and we've all been watching a lot of movies. And one of the things that we've been thinking about here at the festival is you know, what impact does that have on filmmaking and how much do we know about how films get made? And I think one of the things that doesn't get talked about a lot is producers. There's a lot of different kinds of producers. What do they do? What is their role? And we thought it would be really important this year to start focusing on that role, which maybe doesn't get as much of the attention as it should. Um, hopefully you checked out the conversation we had with uh, Amy Green and Chris Stinson earlier in the week. Um, and uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have uh, some incredibly talented uh, producers uh, with us uh, today, um, all of whom have films in this year's festival. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Ariana Garfinkel, who has uh, Spring Valley at this year's festival. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Marga Berea, who has uh, a reckoning in Boston at this year's festival. Welcome, Marga. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Sarah Winchell, who has two films, uh, Strawberry Mansion and We're All Going to the World's Fair. Welcome to all of you. Hi. Uh, and to moderate this, I, another um, great producer uh, who um, most recently uh, had a, a film at uh, our festival, um, Leave No Trace, which won the um, the Grand Jury Prize uh, for Narrative uh, in uh, 2018. So please welcome Linda Reisman. Thank you. Um, really looking forward to this conversation. So uh, Linda, I'm gonna hand. Great, thank you. And it's just so fantastic to, first of all, meet all of you, but also I wanna congratulate you on your films and being included in the IFF Boston Festival this year. So congratulations. Um, I wanted to start just really briefly and have each of you talk a little bit about your trajectory, how you got your start and your path to, to where you are now. Um, Ariana, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Yes. Thank you so much for having me and having the film. Um, uh, yeah. So I've been an independent film producer for about 12 years. Before that, I was in more of a company setting, but it all started, I would say, I thought I was going into journalism. I was on a journalism track. Uh, through high school and college and kind of halfway through college, I started to take a lot of film classes uh, in my English major and then kind of happened into an internship at a documentary film company. And from there it was to a production assistant and then a producer's assistant and then an executive assistant. I spent a lot of time kind of yeah. learning and watching and I had amazing mentors, um, two women in particular who really uh, kind of helped uh, advise and guide me in the early part of my career. And um, so, and I ended up doing a lot of different things. I worked on set for a couple of narrative films. I worked on a Sandra Bullock movie. I worked on an HBO movie in New Orleans. Uh, and I just got to see all the different parts. What are the pieces? What does each person do? And it was very much an on the ground kind of education. 
Um, and then I worked in this more studio setting. I did production and development jobs at Miramax and Tribeca and some smaller production companies. Um, and then also just kind of seeing how all the pieces come together and where could I fit in? What would be my skills and talents to bring mm -hmm. to it? And, um, and then I went on my own in 2008 and I've been just kind of putting out mostly documentaries since then. Uh, I've worked on a couple of sh feature shorts and I've, I've developed some features, but I'm really a documentary uh, film producer primarily. And yeah, I just really, I feel you know lucky to do this kind of work and um, work with teams that are so passionate. That's a really robust and layered history that you have. There's so much to dive into there. Um, on its own. And and Marga, how did you get your start? I'll try to keep it brief because <laughs> it's a long story. Yes. But like like, uh, like Ariana, um, coincidentally, I started in journalism. That's what mm. I thought I was going to do. And very, very quickly, um, I felt uh, an interest and a passion for films. And I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to apply that passion into a studio role very quickly as a screenwriter, no less, for a sitcom. So I yeah. spent um, a while in that world also, like um, she said, learning and observing. I had a lot of different roles in the studio. Um, I was the you know, script supervisor and I was assistant in all kinds of positions. Um, and then after that, I was involved in, as, as a producer, um, line producer and then assistant producer in, in multiple short films um, and whatnot. But when I relocated um, to Boston in 2005, um, shortly after that, I realized that I was going to move into the world of documentary films. Mm -hmm. This was the industry here. Uh, I had a passion for documentaries already because I came from journalism, which those two worlds co combined really well. And uh, yeah, I, I dived right into it. Um, but I became a little bit of a different type of producer of what I ever expected because I'm an impact producer now. And I've been for the past... Uh, almost a decade. So, um, can, so can, my role, uh, so what happened in 2008 is I was brought into this film that had documentary that had just been finished and it had uh, been picked up by Sundance. It was going, everything was going really well, but they didn't know what they were going to do in that rollout, in that phase mm -hmm. of the distribution and everything, you know, was pretty traditional back then in 2008. Um, so they wanted to bring in someone to help them figure out that strategy. And the idea or the role of the impact producer was starting to be, you know, uh, something people talked about in the industry. And so I became that. I, I joined the film and I started to figure out when I'm not producing a film, I'm producing the distribution of the mm -hmm. film. I'm producing this, this different road, you know, at the other side of the journey. Um, Would you say, um, for our audience who may not be familiar with different types of producing, um, that that role of an impact producer might be a parallel to a sales agent on a narrative or feature film? No. Mm, no. It's it's really um, it's it's a very complex role, if I I may say so, um, and different people understand it in different ways. I can mm -hmm. speak for myself and what I've been doing for the past ten years, and it's a role that really extends uh, to many different areas. Uh, but uh, at the core is to build and implement a comprehensive strategy for mm -hmm. the film that is um, creative, that is. Uh, uh, that maximizes the potential of the film. And it can go through any path. It can include film festivals. It can include theatrical, you know, independent uh, screenings, screening tours, uh, partnerships. Um, it's, it's really very uh, multi-platform and multifaceted. That's fantastic. That is real. Well, a reckoning in Boston is very lucky to have you. Um, absolutely. You. And Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about how you got your start? Sure. Um, I was 
um, I studied cinema studies in my undergrad re- uh, studies and um, had really liked, just loved movies forever and um, was not really sure what to do with that degree. Um, and was uh, I went to grad school for media studies thinking, well, that might help. And then um, had been working in and out of the film industry kind of as an assistant here and there and then uh, as working for like a B movie distribution house uh, that made like new nuns with big guns. And I was, <laughs> you know, um, just like as their receptionists and kind of popping in and out of, yeah, working as a waitress and then, you know, um, but then I, uh, I was working at a video store in New York uh, while I was in grad school and then made a friend there um, and she and I both ended up moving to LA around the same time and ended up between jobs at the same time and she's an actress and a writer and a director um, now and at the time she was a comedian and um, kind of looking to start making films and she said you know you've always been someone who I trusted your taste can we try to figure out how to make this movie together and I'd always been a person that my friends would say like can you read my script and give me feedback or you know I went, I, you know, I went to art school and I went, uh, went, you know, was at NYU for cinema studies. So I was always kind of that friend. And so I didn't really know that I had been producing a little bit um, for a long time. And so in 2015, we shot this short that um, she had written and it got into Sundance in 2016 and actually played at IFF Boston and oh, wow. won, I think it won an award. I was very proud because um, I'm from Massachusetts. Um, so I was happy. Um, and then after that, we both kind of looked at each other and said, well, this if this is our first thing we've made, then we should probably keep doing this. Um, and so she went and wrote a feature script and I went and tried to produce as many different kinds of things as I could mm-hmm. to learn what a producer does. Um, so I, you know, I did music videos, I did commercials, I did a bunch of short films, a couple of which ended up also playing at IFF Boston in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, had had success there while learning. And then we went off and shot a feature in 2018 um, called Clara's Ghosts. And then uh, since then, I've just been kind of continuing the grind. That's so great. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it wasn't necessarily a goal, but um, now that I'm doing it, I realize I've always kind of been doing it. You were meant to do it. It's so interesting. <laughs> I love how everyone has come to producing from such a, uh, a, a, ba- a different backgrounds, but also very similar, of doing different things in the industry. Some working at companies, some, you know, uh, working freelance. Uh, and, and that's, uh, it's very different now. I think there are a lot of film students that have in mind that they want to, you know, produce. Can I ask um, each of you, I'd really love to know a a particular challenge and a particular reward of your current film that's at the festival. Sarah, what would you, um, uh, I know you have two, I think you have two films, but um, you have to pick one. Uh, (laughs) If there's a particular challenge that you experienced during the process of, of making the film, and then what you would say was the reward, a reward? That's an interesting question. Um, it's hard because to think of back, you know, the, the making of the film for both films has been kind of a long, not long, but like uh, I think about shooting the movie and that feels like such a little blip in the life right. of making the movie, That's um, right. the production part. So I'm trying to think, I'd definitely say for both films, a big reward was that um, for both Strawberry Mansion and We're All Going to the World's Fair, um, we shot those um, right before the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. So We're All Going to the World's Fair, we wrapped on March 2nd. um, Mm -hmm. And I flew back from New York to LA on, I think, March 8th of last year. So um, we really just barely made it. Um, And Strawberry Mansion, we shot at the end of 2019. And then we had planned for some more kind of splinter shoots throughout 2020 that we ended up canceling and we didn't need them. Mm -hmm. Um, But that I got very lucky that throughout last year when production was not an option and, um, you know, we were all home a lot, that I had two films that were in the edit stage. And every two weeks or every week I had a meeting with my team 
um, for each film. And uh, it really like, it really kept us going, I think. Yeah. And it was really um, a beautiful experience to be able to be part of that creative process during a time when I was really able to focus on each film in a way that if I had been also on other productions or kind of trying to make other things happen, um, I wouldn't have had that kind of undivided attention. Um, and also just like looking forward to those Zooms every Absolutely. week. Um, yeah. It was a really like beautiful thing. And both teams are not, I'm based in Los Angeles and one Strawberry Mansion, the team is based in Baltimore and World's Fair, the team is based in New York. and it ended up really not mattering. Um, I was right. nervous mm -hmm. when I joined both films that I would feel like far away. Um, right. So that was, a, I'd say the reward answer. Um, and then as far as challenges, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's been challenging not to have seen the movie at, except for on my computer um, for both, I think. Sure. Um, I know that that's maybe not an answer about like, producing the film, but yeah, it that's, a, it. that's a challenge. We're, yeah, we're working yeah. on releasing both films and putting them out in theaters. And at this point, there's a lot of people at, out there that maybe have seen them in theaters. And I'm not used to that. It feels a little like wobbly. I'm a little nervous. I'm like, what's out there? Are we, we, we really feel good about it. You know, and I, I'm really proud of them, but I do feel a little bit almost disconnected or something. They both premiered at Sundance and it was just such a, it was such a wonderful thing, but also kind of a heartbreaking thing to not be able to sit next to my so team. Different, and, yeah. A different Sundance. Yes. And, and oh. thank you. And Ariana, what about you with Spring Valley? Um, any particular challenge uh, in, in getting your film made or getting it seen? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the challenge part because um, Sometimes with a film, even a documentary, it doesn't have a script, but you know the ending or you kind of know the storyline. And I would say with this film, one of the big challenges was finding that narrative. What was mm -hmm. the story that we were going to tell over four years of production? Mm -hmm. So it, the film, just to give you a, a little bit of context, is about an incident that happened in a South Carolina classroom in 2015 when a a teenage girl was ripped out of her desk and thrown across the room by a school-based police officer. And um, she was arrested for, she was accused of having her cell phone out in class. And then a second student, another teenage girl who stood up to record it and object verbally was also arrested and taken mm -hmm. to directly to jail from school. So it's a very challenging topic, just a really mm -hmm. difficult and painful um, topic but felt important you know to bring to light um especially because i think this was a video that went viral a lot of people saw in 2015 mm -hmm. but you don't really hear anything further on a, on a lot of these incidents you know some there's a there's a large reaction but people don't know what led up to it what happened after and what the context is of the systems that are built to enable something like this uh, on a regular basis. So we began with just that incident and the, the story that the second girl who stood up had become a plaintiff in a case for the ACLU to try to take down the law that the girls were both arrested under. And that was it. We just had Naya mm -hmm. say yes, she would do an interview with us. And we began just, we just went and met her and her family. So from there to put all of the other pieces together where where are we headed and how can we you know do the most um, justice to this story um, along the way so that that was and so here we are four years later and this is the reward is to be able to uh, see it enter the world and like Sarah said it is really hard to not watch people watch the film and yeah, not I'm sure to interact but I do feel really grateful that uh, one of our our main participants in the film, Vivian Anderson, has been able to be part of, uh, the, she was in the IFB Q&A and to really engage with people about the film and to receive um, the, the feedback, you know, at least in some more personal way than sure. you know, being out there. So this is the, the beginning of the reward phase, I think, is being able to connect people, see the impact, um, and the kind of work that Marga is doing too, just you know, to be able to to see some change potentially come out of the work that you're doing. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. And and Margo, with the reckoning in Boston, was there um, a particular challenge that you had when you started working with the film? I want to talk about the biggest challenge with the film that it started before my time with the film, but uh, has been very important to my role in the film. Um, and just let me say that working with a film like A Reckoning in Boston, it, it's a reward in itself. Mm -hmm. I, with my company, I work with many, many documentary features and shorts across the years. And, um, and th this film is a dream. It's just mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful. But so the challenge was that this film started being one thing um, and ended up being another. And it took them five years of filming um, to figure out what that other iteration was going to be. So the filmmaker, just for those who don't know about the film, the filmmaker started um, simply going to a night course in the humanities in the neighborhood of Dorchester here in Boston, because he had heard one of the uh, course graduates give a speech and he was very impressed. And this was a course for people who had not had a chance to finish high school, uh, who had dropped out of school. They, uh, you know, were people who were homeless, people who were really struggling. And this was re really rigorous course in the humanities mm -hmm. that would even give them uh, course credits uh, for Bard College. So he went there, he was really intent on recording um, people just taking the course and see what the what that would be in their lives. Um, and so over a period of time, he started also following the people uh, from the classroom outside of the classroom. He started a relationship with two of the students, uh, Carl Chandler and Coffee Dixon, um, and the director, James uh, Rottenbeck, um, started going with them to you know, things like house court or to just their uh, their backyard where they were trying to um, create an urban farm or to take care of their grandchildren, whatnot. And slowly he realized, well, wait a minute. I live three miles from these people. I had never had any of the challenges that I'm experiencing with these people. How This is not working. How am I telling this story? Mm. So he really paused at that point. That was a huge challenge, like halfway through filming, and said, I can't tell this story. This story is not coming together. Um, so things shifted into um, Coffee and Carl becoming more active in the production of the film and having a stronger role in telling their own story. Um, and so that collaboration started to shape the film in a different way. And a third iteration was that at some point, um, uh, James was told, look, you need to also be part of the film. You need, you're asking these people to be so vulnerable for you, to tell you uh, their stories, to allow you into their lives. And you are observing and you can observe no more. You need, you are involved. You are partially responsible of what's happening in Boston and you need to be um, an active participant mm -hmm. in the story. So that's how the story ended up being what it is today. And the reward that came to me is that this back story has become the real impact. It has mm. become people um, really take on and say, wow, you know, a collaborative documentary where the subjects end up being co-producers, where the filmmaker goes through a journey of five years and ends up being able to be so humble to recognize, look, this is not, I'm not doing this right. Uh, so that was a huge reward for me because for the past six months, uh, our partners, and we've made now between 25 and 30 partnerships for the film, mm. they have all responded to this story so well. They have said, yes, this is the conversation we want to have on our campuses, on our you know, uh, professional associations and, and whatnot. So it's been a, really a reward for me that challenge or, or series of challenges that they had to go through in production and how they they chose to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an amazing story and, and history to that project. I had no idea, although I have to say most of my projects take many, many, many years. So it's something that I'm used to. 
So, I mean, for all of us, I think, you know, during the pandemic, speaking for myself, it's been nearly impossible for independent producers, most producers that I know, um, to be in production. We can't get insurance. The COVID protocols are, you know, uh, on average 15 to 20% added onto your budget. But yet, ironically, on a global basis, there is so much production going on right now uh, around the world in Boston. Um, in fact, in Boston, there are so many films coming in or shooting that crews have to be brought in. The crew base that's typically in Boston is, is uh, uh, taken up. Um, those films are being financed primarily by studios and streamers. And I would certainly consider Netflix to be a studio at this point. So on the one hand, we have literally uh, an overflow of product and content that's being made around the world. But yet, for those of us who work independently, budgets, I'm gonna say under 20, it could be under 10, it could be under five, um, it's nearly impossible to get these films made unless you have a distributor in place, such as a streamer. And so I'm wondering for all of you, aside from the challenges of not being able to have what we might call a normal rollout, seeing our films in a theater, seeing our films in an audience, being at the festival, um, in terms of developing projects or your other work, how have you managed during this past year um, to, to feel that you're moving things forward? Aside from editing two films at <laughs> once, Sarah. Um, but how have you as producers, um, or Marga, you know, an impact producer felt that you have continued to be as proactive and vibrant in your work as you might be under normal circumstances. Sarah, do you wanna, um, do you have any Yeah, thoughts? I have a couple of thoughts. Yeah, um, one thing that happened that I thought was really sort of nice was that um, I was able to, there's a couple of projects that I hadn't been able to make time for last year, mm -hmm. um, notably a documentary that um, is all the footage had been shot, but um, sh the director had been sort of needing to get to the next phase. Mm -hmm. And um, it's about um, a phone hacker uh, named Joy Bubbles. And it's about connecting with people over the telephone when you can't be with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a project that I was able to kind of jump in on and, and, and we're moving it forward now. And it's in, po you know, it's in a post stage. So, that was something that we were able to kind of get a little bit more traction on because we were saying like, well, you know, I mean, we're still saying it, it's not, you know, finished or anything like that, um, but that we can say, we can make this now and there's no added, there's no added COVID costs. Like we are, work, you know, we are happy to work with an editor remotely, even if COVID mm -hmm. didn't exist. And we have animation elements that we were gonna be working with freelance animators anyways. So. Um, so that's been a really exciting project that mm -hmm. I would have probably not necessarily been able to jump on. Um, mm -hmm. So that was one thing that happened. And then I will say the other thing is this week I am trying to make a movie. Um, yep. In my backyard right now we're doing yeah, a makeup great. test. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it is, I will, I will agree with you, Linda, it is very hard with everything. And, you know, these are micro budgets under, you know, under $300,000 movies oh, wow. um, that we're making. And, and um, it, it is kicking my butt. I will say it's been so hard um, being sort of responsible for the health and safety of my crew mm -hmm. in a way that um, I'm just not used to um, and testing and, and everything has been like just adding that to the list is, is wild on top of the fact that it, it's the same in Los Angeles as it is in Boston right now where all the big studios and commercial production companies are back in business. So, you know, right. even booking crew for something like our little film has been pretty just, it's just a totally different world. Um, so 
but I'm, like a, I'm working on it and we're doing it. It was yes, well, to be last year and we waited and we waited and here we are. So and, we'll and like happens. any great producer, you're just jumping in and making it happen. And I think <laughs> that's for all of us um, something that we sort of keeps us going. And and Ariana, what how about you? How's your how have you managed during this past year? Yeah, this last year I've been as busy as I have ever been because oh. also uh, I had a film. Well, similarly, we were editing this whole year with Spring Valley, so that was you know a day daily um, work. But also, uh, a film that I produced just before this, Never Too Late, the Doc Severinsen story, was oh. about to premiere right before the pandemic. Uh, we were supposed to be at. Cleveland and full frame opening night. And so everything, um, you know, kind of the dominoes fell from there last year, but just figuring out, okay, how are we going to make a, a virtual festival run? What does this all look like? What's the distribution going to be? And kind of um, putting all of that into action, you know, just in a slightly different way than we, than we had anticipated. So I was, yeah, I felt like I was kind of busy putting all of that together, um, but just to pivot on, you know, what you were talking about with the streamers, which, you know, it does feel very true that it's becoming, the pandemic aside, harder and harder for independent producers to, to get the funds and get, and also just, you know, sell a film. The acquisitions market is really different now that, you know, all of this money is coming in up front. So I, I'm, I'm getting part, to that question. I okay. am, I'm getting <laughs> So that's that's the thing that I, is on my mind right now is like okay how are we gonna you know move forward yeah. and make this more sustainable for everybody? Yeah. And Marga, how has your your year been? <laughs> so it it sure was very disruptive, right, for everyone. But um, the thing is, my entire strategy and the way impact distribution is designed is precisely to be really an out of the box thinker mm -hmm. and to create avenues that are non-traditional mm -hmm. and to be very open to diversify exhibition, to uh, go to find audiences where they are, to build this sustainability uh, for the filmmaker. So all of those things, um, they could still be done during the pandemic. And like Ariana, I found myself busier than ever there was not there were not enough hours in the day i've never slept so little it's <laughs> because we were always on through through this media through the, the zoom like right. constantly on for a project or another and i would say that it it was difficult um especially after the first shock in in march when we got I think close to 50 screenings canceled that we had lined up mm. for, for films. Um, after the first shock, um, I think one of the things that I enjoyed was that I could work more with a couple of documentary shorts. Shorts are um, difficult in general, right? <laughs> to get out into the world and make a revenue for them mm -hmm. and to, to really um, make something meaningful, but the pandemic made it possible for documentary shorts to have more of a spotlight. Mm -hmm. because the format lends itself really nicely to all these Zoom conversations. Uh, so people were very willing to break a block of an hour of their time. And we went everywhere with those shorts. Closed libraries wanted us to be in, converse, in a Zoom conversation with their patrons and schools, uh, you know, all kind of groups said yes to an hour slot, a documentary short that was meaningful to them, and a conversation. Um, so that was, you know, that's that wonderful. Was and that's, I, I think, some of the irony of of the pandemic is being able to virtually reach audiences in a different way, um, which has been interesting to see. But so I want to sort of pivot to to. Um, this, this um, issue of where we are in the industry. And uh, from my point of view, we are right dab in the middle of some pretty seismic changes here in terms of particularly for narrative features, how films are financed, uh, how they're distributed, 
how are we getting people to uh, see our films, um, narrative films in particular. And I'd love to know what you each see uh, or what you hope for in the future for independent filmmaking. Um, you know, for an audience that isn't perhaps as familiar with the role of the producer, one of those roles has to include raising the financing, putting those pieces together, as well as strategically uh, making decisions about film festivals, which festivals you're gonna submit to and, and distribution and so forth. So what are you each hoping for, given the shifts that are going on right as, as we speak in the industry? Ariana, <laughs> I know this has been on your mind, I can tell. Yeah, well, I can't speak as much on the narrative part, but I would love to turn it back to you, Linda, too, since you know, you're yeah. part of this panel and, and I'm sure I have insights on it. Um, but I, for documentary, I do feel like one of the big pushes right now, and I'm part of an organization called the Doc Producers Alliance, which has been advocating since 2016 and for and more sustainability for independent documentary producers, but it applies to, I think, you know, everybody making films independently is that it's not a sustainable model to just take all the risk, uh, right. work for free or for very, very little, and then just roll the dice and hope that the film gets picked up and that everybody can, you know, recoup on the other end. It's not, it's not the way that this no. is built. And I you know people are very happy to take advantage of that. But I think, you know, the DPA is putting out really incredible guidelines about how the industry should be, you know, protecting the creative labor that uh, everybody's bringing to the table and to be able to continue to put this kind of work out. So that's, you know, that's where my head is. It's just, you know, how can we really set some boundaries and guidelines that we have to obey ourselves, you know, because I think Absolutely. we're very eager to get the, get it out there. And I'm, I'm just speaking for myself that I'm always, you know, I will put myself in the last place, but I, that doesn't help anybody in the long run. And especially when we're trying to create, you know, an inclusive and equitable, you know, world here. So I, I think that's the thing is just having these conversations um, loudly and transparently about where, where we can, protect creativity. Absolutely. I agree with you completely. And Sarah, how, how have you thought, I'm sure you have, much about, um, you know, where we are and where you see the independent world headed? Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely agree with everything Ariana said. And I also am part of the DPA and working in the, in one of the working groups about sustainability, trying to help us figure out, you know, getting some kind of industry standards on how we treat our ourselves <laughs> when we make a movie because um, it's just, it's something I feel like I'm always talking about with my colleagues and always comes up in conversations like this, which is that like increasingly our job, especially with the streamers being more and more kind of involved uh, with certain kinds of projects, um, our job becomes more and more important to vouch for the other kinds of projects, which are, you know, not to say that um, the movies I'm making won't end up on a Netflix or whatever it is, but that like, that the point is that we're trying to make stuff that can kind of live in all different kinds of places and not be beholden to the to the mega corporations. And, and you know, I, I think of myself as someone who's making art. And so um, trying to keep that in mind and, and also make m movies the way that I was taught it happens is that I was taught, you know, like you said, Ariana, you put yourself last, you got you, you know, too much to ask for to demand a fee up front, you know, it's like, we were the ones making the budgets, we all know too much. Um, and so I found that the DPA, um, what, what we've been doing, what they've been doing, I just joined it, but um, has been really helpful to remember that, like, there's only so much we can do for ourselves. And if we don't do it for ourselves first and that like Absolutely. by working for free, you're doing an injustice to everybody else that's doing this job as well. So um, I agree that Ariane, I'm hoping that that kind of conversation just like becomes louder. Um, and I think it has been. Um, and so now it's a kind of 
we're getting to a place where it's going to be a leap of like, is is the rest of the industry going to come with us? <laughs> and you know, right. like if if they don't, I don't. I don't know that I'll be able to keep doing the work. And that's I think, a yeah. frustrating feeling to have. Um, I so. think that that's, we need a separate panel <laughs> to, <laughs> to talk and be able to explain different roles that producers have and their income streams. You know, how a producer, that a line producer uh, can be hired to work freelance to oversee the nuts and bolts of a production a creative producer, and I know some folks don't like that reference, um, develops material, works for years and years without being paid until a film gets made. So that idea, Sarah, I am not a fan of, of, you know, put yourself last and don't get paid. And so that's another conversation right. that we have to have. I will say, and I don't know how public this is, so I can't say a lot, that there is uh, for narrative producers, a very, very robust movement afoot um, in an organizational uh, uh, manner to uh, protect producers, yes. creative producers. So hopefully we'll be publicly uh, announcing something within the next year. It is not associated with the Producers Guild, although the Producers Guild knows about it and is very supportive of it. But for a lot of those things, Sarah, that you you just yes. referenced. I definitely you know. am, have been in those those meetings as well. I'm definitely. Yeah, you have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, we're, and, I think we're going to, you know, there's some tide will change somehow. It has to because we're the ones kind of pushing things along. I mean, it's true. So. Right. Well, and I think that folks, again, um, I'm thinking of an audience who might be watching this may not realize that producers of independent films um, don't necessarily, aren't necessarily paid very much for their labor, which goes beyond the period of, of pre-production and production and post-production. Um, and this is, we're not talking about the $100 million Apple and Netflix shows. We're talking about something very different. Um, Margo, I'm curious your, your views on the future and sustainability in the documentary space and, and what you see. Um, I just want to add that I have been very excited by the interest in doc films over the past couple of years. That... Uh, there is a, a much bigger audience, it seems to me, for documentary films, which is great. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And um, and thank you, Ariana and Sarah, for the work with DPA. I've been following that. And I didn't know anyone uh, personally who was involved, but I think that they've been doing great work in in yeah, so I will speak of the distribution uh, piece because mm -hmm. that's, that's my expertise right now. And uh, I think there is no going back, that there is, uh, as you said, seismic changes in the world mm -hmm. of distribution uh, and it will never again be the way it was, which I consider it to be a good thing. Um, I started into the work that I do because I wanted to be an advocate for the films, mm -hmm. for the documentaries, because I was seeing a lot of, um, uh, I don't know what to say, but a lot of abuse in a way in the, when documentaries go out into distribution and how um, uh, people handle that situation. So traditional distribution sees uh, itself as a destination, right? Mm -hmm. Placement, a, a, a place where to go and, and park the film. And the way I've seen distribution and impact producers work is we see distribution as a journey. Mm -hmm. So it's a journey to make the film and there is a journey to get the film out into the people who should watch it and should uh, use it for multiple purposes that are not simply to stream it from you know, a big corporation that is gonna end up paying you very little taking the film, signing a contract this thick, saying that you basically have no more rights after you put your signature in there. Mm -hmm. And I've also been always been a big fan of multi-platform, of non-exclusive deals, mm -hmm. of um, really work 
at everything, every single window and every single aspect to maximize your potential and to feel free, you know, to hold your, your document and your from close to your chest and say, this is my work, my labor is valuable. And no, it's not going to go on YouTube for free. <laughs> or no, I'm not going to accept that payment. That's not enough. Or right. uh, so this kind of negotiations and this fight needs to continue to happen and be more of the norm. And there needs to be more transparency in the field. There's to be more, uh, uh, you know, diversity in the field. And all of these things that I think the pandemic has uh, brought into light and into the, the forefront of the conversation, they need to stay there. And I'm, ho I'm hoping for change. Well, my last question, I see we're, we're right up against it here. Um, what advice do you have for emerging producers? <laughs> I would love to know from, from each of you. Ariana, I'm gonna start with you. Okay. What, what do you want to impart on emerging producers? Um, I think the, the one thing that maybe we haven't talked about really is what is a producer, you know, what does mm -hmm. a producer do? Because that's what people ask me all the time. And, um, you know, I just want to, I feel like what I want to say to an emerging producer is, yes, you're, you know, at the end of the day, people see you as the keeper of kind of the legal and the financial. These are the, the sort of headlines of what are our responsibility. And I think that's important to highlight because, you know, just in that, what we were saying before about distributors and streamers, they need those parts to be secure. And so, you know, it, it is a very important role, but I, you know, for a producer that's um, passionate and creative, you know, as we all are, I think it's really about the relationship that you have with your team and with your director mm -hmm. and finding the right people to work with that appreciate, you know, all the things that you have to bring to that process and um, that, that it's a true partnership and just really think of it that way that you're not, uh, you know, support team, you are a team. Yeah, well said. And, and Marga, what, what advice would you impart on an emerging producer? Um, I, I would say if you want to dedicate yourself to the field of impact production, um, you really need to be passionate about the films that you're going to work with. You need to be very knowledgeable of the industry. You need to uh, be very creative. And you need to know what you're getting into. This industry mm -hmm. is, is difficult in terms of sustainability. Um, but it's also very rewarding. Uh, it's the best job in the world, I think. Uh, for those of us who work in film, we can't leave it. <laughs> no matter what. Um, so, yeah, you know, believe in yourself, look around, learn, be flexible, be humble, um, and, and just go out and do it. Um, and, and love the film. Just, just love it and believe, believe in it. That's really well said. And Sarah, what would you impart on an emerging producer? Um, I think similar, similar advice, I guess. Um, I would say that part of the, the, is the part of the kind of growing into the job is figuring out what parts of the job you really want to make yours and communicating that with the people you're working with. Um, Cause that's been, I think the more I do that, the more success I have and that kind of more kind of success. I, oh, sorry. Hold on. Guys, sorry. like I said, we're doing a makeup. <laughs> <laughs> um, Perfect. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, just to, to say to whoever you're working with, because it can be a little bit unforgiving, you know, this is the part that I'm excited about. And so, you know, there's going to be a lot of parts that we do with the filmmaking that we aren't excited about necessarily, or that are hard um, and and a little bit punishing. But to make sure that you're clear with the filmmakers you're working with that um, you know they're that you're there for 
what what reasons are there for what they want from you and what you want from them. I think that's a really right. important conversation to have at the beginning of any project. That's very important. And and Ariana, you're right. We didn't really talk about that role of a producer, which is can be all encompassing. Um, I like to think of great storytelling, communication, collaboration. Mm -hmm. And because so much of this industry and, and Margo, as you said, you know, it, it can be unforgiving in a certain way, is about rejection, not raising the money, not getting the actor that you want, um, not getting the location you want. Having a robust support system, I think is, um, at least for me, is is essential of other producers. So I, I hope that we can have a, a part B of this panel at some point. But thank you all for participating today and congratulations again on your films. Very exciting. And I'm sure that the IFF uh, audiences will feel the same way. Um, yeah, on behalf of the festival, I want to thank you all. I mean, obviously, uh, Ariana, Marga, and Sarah, just for sharing your films with us, mm -hmm. uh, but all of you, including Linda, for sharing your time. I think this was a fascinating conversation. I think it just proves we need to have more of these. Uh, so we look forward to having more of those in the future. Uh, so thank you again for joining us, and uh, thanks, everyone, for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.